Okay. Um, another example of of uh, coding is something called pseudocoding, and so I'll just create a document, an example of what pseudocoding is. So I'll create a document, empty document. Open it up and make it really large. Okay. And so a pseudocode would like be if you're writing a basic program, but it's really just for you. It's not to be interpreted by a computer. And an example of one would be just like the lamp. Uh, um, uh, is lamp on. And it says ask for input A if A is equal to no no then and it might look like this that might be a then this is an old C style then so I say if it's no then you say input B um, and you put a print here so print something like that and so that that's pseudocode it's really not meant to be a, a more example better example of it is collect um, present login page login page um, if login has login name is incorrect you know so jump to make this bigger if the login page is incorrect use javascript to correct login and then you would uh, say if login is name is correct or um, permit um, set flag um, set Login, login, name, flag, correct. And you say if password uh, is um, is proper, um, it's not, it's not proper. Use JavaScript. To correct password and so it would be stuff like that like you were just sitting there you know making a recipe out and you might put numbers next to these two one and that might actually end up being zero or you might just do it like one two three four like that and so that's um that's how you would uh, that's how you would determine like how things are supposed to be um, th that's how you organize your thoughts before you write a program uh, and you these would each one of these would probably translate to a function or any amount of extra programming that you would do like your programming might look like this uh, present a login page so you might write some HTML that uh, that looks like this this would be a web page and you would say uh, input uh, input type type text name login value uh, Place login name, login name, or you just put login name. Login.
second name, and that would be double quotes. And uh, then you would probably have some JavaScript, uh, which would be something like script, and then you'd have some JavaScript. So not really very good at JavaScript myself, and that would um, and what I'm writing up here is what's called hypertext mar mar uh, markup language, and it looks like that. If you go and you look at a normal web page, like let's look at this web page here. If we do a view page source, then you'll see all this junk here, and we can decode this junk. Now this is not a programming language per se. This is what's called a markup. It's a visual language. It's how the page is broken down. And uh, the the operators are, are these purple letter things here. This right here means load some JavaScript. Now JavaScript is a programming language, but the page, the web page, uh, uses up all of this little, these little tags. The, this thing right here is called a tag. This thing, it starts with a less than, it ends with a greater than. And so those are called tags. And that's how, it, this one right here is called a style sheet. And this is used to determine the style of the way the page looks by giving certain attributes of the, uh, of the item of the page. And this right here is called a paragraph. That's a paragraph tag, and then here's a link. So when we click on a link on the page, that's what defines the link. And, uh, and then you've got, this is a div, div, this is, I don't know what div stands for, but it's a divider, it's, um, it's a container um, tag, it's used for containing stuff setting things apart. Um, old school way of doing this would be called using a table. But um, new web developers don't use tables. Uh, options are, um, these are specialty things like um, pull down menus and and uh, check boxes and things like that. And this, this would probably be some menus so you can probably find those menus if we go and look in the program. This is an option menu. And so we find our stuff like the other and travel RPG graphics. So those will probably be in here. And this uh, under, yeah, so there's the graphics. So we we're just looking at, and this is the menu that was under Rod's color pattern. We go back over here and we look under graphics and we will find Rod's color pattern. And then Scribble is somewhere further down on this list. So we'll go over here and look for Scribble or Squiggle, there's Scribble right there. And this right here is a the value there specifies what it is the person selected when they selected that option, there's probably some JavaScript code somewhere down here that tries to figure out what you did based upon it. So let me see. It's probably with inside the script stuff. That is what's being, what's determined. So these are like JavaScript programs. And if I go in there, we'll see some JavaScript. And this is what a JavaScript program looks like. And the great thing about web, um, web uh, HTML and JavaScript is this is stuff you can do on a web browser. So if you use a web browser and you get, you know, say you go into Google and you're, you know, looking up the word text and it shows you a bunch of text, each one of these is an HTML page. And this HTML page uh, this web page uses hypertext markup language and you can see how any page looks by looking at its its HTML, its markup and how it's broken down is there and uh, 
sometimes it'll have some JavaScript in it. But this thing we call a browser, um, and your web, your even your cell phone has got these web browsers. Everybody's got these web browsers. Some are full feature, some are not. The ones that are on the desktop have a whole bunch of stuff like. Um, there is usually a developer mode in here, web developer mode. And you can go in there and you can do, uh, there's a debugger and all sorts of stuff that permits you to more easily create, what's well, a scratch pad? So, yeah. So there's like all sorts of stuff in here to permit you to do web development. And web development is basically writing programs as we do in this basic language that I first introduced you guys to, we could do this on, since this is a web page, this isn't really a programming interpreter. It is, but it's it's running inside of a web page. And so if we go into um, web developer mode and we look at the web console, then we can see what the um, somewhere in here we can see what the, see there's the inspector. This lets us look at the individual elements that are in the page. And the console lets us see the result of any action, like if we hit run here, it might show us something here. Let's see loops. Bugger style performance, memory, network, storage. So there's like all sorts of different ways we can look at our program that's running here. And uh, so, so um, it, it's all a matter of like how much complexity you want to deal with, you know. And the, the great thing about learning an old school basic interpreter is that there isn't a whole lot of complexity in, in front of you, especially if you get yourself an old Commodore 64. And if you're like really intent on going the old school red of programming, um, this is what you do. You go to eBay, you go on to eBay, or you go someplace like that and you say, I want a Commodore 64, a commode. We used to call them commodes. You want a commode? Yeah, I'll have a Commodore 64. So you get a you get an old school vintage computer, vintage computing, uh, and uh, mainframes computers. And this is like people selling old computer parts. So I'm, I think of maybe an Atari Excel there are a lot of these put out. Vintage Atari 800 XL console only. That's probably okay, but you still need an old school TV set and you can't, you can't really come by those anymore. So it, there might be an Atari XL HDMI connector. Let's try that. And Atari Flashback Gold. So this is a that's an Atari. Um, that's not a computer. Um, wonder if they have a, a vintage. See the problem with running one of these old computers is that you need to have what's called an RGB monitor, or um, oh. Sometimes they use composite outputs. So you could probably use a composite output to it. Um, let me see what's on the back of an Atari 2600. I mean, uh, not Atari 2600, XML. So Atari XML ports and images. So they'll show us what's on the back of an Atari XML. Yuck. And this old school, old school. 
Uh, see, I, I just, so I, uh, I, okay. So it's got this right here, that right there, if we can zoom that up. You usually have, and this is your this is your video output is this little thing right here, and you would hook that up. You'd probably hook that up to a to a, a video input, but that's what would go to your TV box. And if you had a TV that had an old school antenna, you would hook it up to an RF modulator, and that would uh, permit you to use your TV set as a computer monitor. And uh, that right there is, what the heck is that? I have no idea, but you would turn the thing on. This is expansion, so you put hook cartridges into it that, that way. But you know, at the very basics, all you need, what you need is you need to have a, a RF modulator. So you would say, I'm looking for an RF modulator for a HDMI. So they probably have something like that. An RF to RF to uh, HDMI. Probably find it on Amazon. Amazon. So we got Amazon. Electronics, RF modulators. There's a really basic one. I think that's what it is. And then so you look around on here for an RF modulator that hooks to your HDMI to an HDTV. There's someone's bound to have one. And then you just hook it right into your into your TV. Then you can get one of these old school computers and hook it up to that. And each old school computer, each one of these old school computers, have a um, are pretty complete. And the reason why you want to use one of these old computers to learn how to program rather than using something modern is that. Um, your opera there's almost nothing between the programming language and the operating and the hardware that's on the computer so you can do sound you can do graphics and you just make really basic programs and you it doesn't use a mouse you don't need a mouse at best you could use a joystick if you wanted to there probably are uh, ways that you could hook mice up to these to these computers but um most of the programmers you see today they're in their 40s and 50s this is the program these are the computers they first used this is where i learned how to program was on one of these old school computers this is an xml this is atari based and the taris were kind of nice they had some graphics and some basic sounds they weren't fantastic um the reason why people like the commodes, the Commodore 64s, is um, they had a SID chip in them. So they they had some pretty good graphics. But uh, Microsoft put BASIC on it, but the Microsoft kind of play, kind of played chicken with uh, Commodore 64 by just um, not permitting you. To, they let you have access to the hardware, but you had to use something called poke and peek and what poke does is it lets you set um little memory registers inside of your computer um by specifying the register and how what how to set it and peek lets you read what's inside the register inside the computer so a register might be like a variable um but sometimes you can read it sometimes you can write to it but and sometimes you can't do both sometimes you can do both it, it really depends on where you're what you're trying to do in the computer and um 
you could even write a program that's like nothing but pokes and peaks where you're writing into an area of memory and then you're going to execute from that area of memory. So that's what they call assembly programming, but it's, um, it's not assembly, it's um, machine language type programming using hexadecimal, all sorts of stuff. And that's more comp complex, but you could still do it inside of these one of these old Commodore 64s. Um, but the Commodore 64s had very basic programming. If you wanted to do something that was more complex, you could use a, a cartridge. So you could use a cartridge uh, for Commodore 64. And we called it, um, the name of the cartridge was um, extended basic or something like that. So, and Simon's basic was one, and uh, let me see if there's another one in here. I think it was called uh, Expander. It was the basic Expander. I'll call it Expander. I'm not finding that the exact thing that I used to use was in Simon's. It was, um, and you may even find there used to be this voice synthesizer. You get a voice synthesizer for the Commodore 64. So you can say voice, voice synthesizer, voice synthesizer. Yeah. There's not much of it. <laughs> I seem to be getting the same stuff no matter what search I do. Yeah. Okay. Anywho. Um, you can also just get a, a, a online thing. But you can use your web browser and you learn JavaScript. The, the reason why you would want to use an old school computer, as I said, is, is that there's very little between the, the hardware that's on the, on the computer, and that would be like your sound port and your, uh, or your graphics card or anything like that, but between what's in the computer and what your program is. And the war you're going to be facing if you're working with a modern computer is getting access to the basic hardware because the operating system tries to tries to let all the programs have access to all the little features that are on it but some things that you would get that would expand it would require their own little libraries what they're called libraries of functions and then you connect to those you you write a program and you have to load in libraries to access functions that permit you to work with the graphics on the screen or work with your sound card. And that just ends up being too complex for any anybody who's just wanting to do some basic stuff. And so I could talk about doing stuff like that with just uh, with a programming language like PHP. Now PHP is a web programming language. There's all sorts of programming languages. Um, so we could go to computer languages and I could tell you what the difference is between them all and which ones you probably want to start learning to program with. And so let's go down to the programming languages Wikipedia page. So so computer language, types of computer programming language, command language, machine language assembly, markup language, style sheet. Okay, this is web languages. These are not languages. These are not computer languages. These are markup languages. They're not computer languages. That's stupid. Whoever put that in there should be shot because those are not. Modeling languages 
is something else. That's not a computer language. That's for <laughs> to whoever set up this page is should be shot in and and uh, hung somewhere and put on public display as not a person who really knows what they're talking about when they're talking about computer languages. So this article has multiple issues. Yes, it is not. Let's go to computer languages. A uh, list of computer languages, architecture, graphic. No, no, those are not computer language. Uh, a computer language has to have this attribute. It's got to have variables. It's got to have operations. It, and if it doesn't have operations, if, it's, if it doesn't have variable operations, if it doesn't process, then it isn't a computer language. Um, HTML is not a computer language. It's great for making things look good on a web page, but in itself, it can't do any. It can't work with variables, and it can't. Um, it can't do processes. You need JavaScript in order to make web pages do something. JavaScript is a programming language. Um, XML is not a language. It's a data storage format. HTML is a is it what's called a um, a subset of XML XML is a superset XML is actually the structure of how you would make a, a markup language now you could you could define a programming language inside of something like XML using XML XML is just strictly for the structuring of data within a, a structuring of text data. Now when we talk about data is just everything is data. Um, the difference between code and data. Code, it, you can execute data, you can just in, it, you interpret. Um, there is a program, there's a language called assembly, let's call it machine language. Machine language, so I do machine language and so machine code there's probably a good example and uh, let's go for 8086 that's what I learned with um, 8086 and this is the this is the first PC Intel PC chip this is what the IBM PCs were based on and the we might have some assembly language in here somewhere and shoot. let's see if we can get a 8086 simulator here emulator online let's put it online so you can see if we can get one inside of the web browser here. Yeah. So this is an 8086 emulator and it's assembly. And let's get an 8086 program assembly. find a program to run on it. Oh, I got an assembly language programming tutorial. Is it 8086? Now, see, each chip has its own has its own language. 8086 sample code. There we go. This might bring back some memories for me because I used to do some of this. Hex to ASCII. So this is what it looks like. Let me zoom it up. It looks like this is the if you really want to learn how to code and you really just don't care, um, you could do this. And this is called assembly language. And uh say push. So these are pushing these thing this is pushing all the registers on a stack. So I could probably put this directly inside 
of this emulator. So I paste. Okay. So you run. Oh, okay. I'll put that now. I try to run. Yeah, I don't know. This thing actually, uh, a real assembler, a real real um, eight hundred eight six assembler will not <laughs> will not do syntax checks or something. It would actually execute whatever. It might do syntax, but uh, let's see. If you get on, if you have MS DOS, you could do some assembly programming on your old uh, Windows 98 machine. You go into console mode and type up debug, and that will throw you directly into an 8086 assembly programming. And then you could do some 8086 assembler. And the, the best way to do that is to get an assembly book. So we find an 8086 assembly book. See if I can find one that I used to work with. Hey, this this looks familiar. Yeah. And you would you would program something in assembly. Yeah. Let's see. Let me see if I can assembly um source code. Oh, it's got an introduction. Let's see what that is. Does this look anything like it? That doesn't, I don't, that looks kind of foreign to me. X86 assembly. Move EX. So this is actual assembly. This is probably uh, source before. So this is probably oh that's um like a higher level assembly. Add this ESP as a register. And inside of assembly programming, how you would you wouldn't use variables like you would use in Python or use in some high level language. You use registers, and registers are like. Um, they're basically the most basic form of, of data inside of the computer. It doesn't work with memory inside of the, the computer. It, it uses it with respect to register. So it might reference a memory location and then you would work with that. Now, if you really wanted to learn how to program a computer on a very low level and you wanted to, this would be the kind of thing you would go and say, back in the old days, this is what I used to do, and it kicks all you young Turks ass, you know. That's, you, this would be assembly programming that, that you would be doing. And uh, you'd be working with registers, registers. Um, in your CPU, you have, you have a whole bunch, you have some memory in there called register memory. And, or it's, or there's a cache memory inside the, but then there's registers, and then the very very basic of the computer that you're working with like a limited number of registers. There might only be eight registers, and each register will represent like um, anywhere between a byte and four bytes. Um, you have a 32-bit register that's called a four-byte register, or it might be a one-byte register. So it is. 8 bits and so a uh, bit is an on and off uh, that's what they talk about when they talk about 0 1 if they're talking about an 8 bit byte a byte of memory they're talking about 8 of those zeros ones or zeros and so let me take in my document I'll give you an example of um, let's go over here okay we'll get clear that out so um, this is, 
you know when you when you're dealing with bits um, this is this is like a bit you know there is an on off on off on off on off the reason why they use bits and they don't use like decimal numbers like they don't use 1 through 10 through 100 they use bits because with bit, um, it's very easy to represent in a piece of electronics. You you can represent it as a as a um, as a gate, uh, close or open. You know, it's very easy if you can store uh, uh, something that's either there or not there. That's the same as if something is on or off. Um, so everything inside of a computer it uses bits and there it, if it's yes or no it might be on that might be yes this might be no or you might be taking it the opposite direction this might be no and this might be yes but it's all dependent upon what your code is doing now how would uh, bits be used in reference to command um you um it all depends, let's start at the very basics. When you run a program in a computer, um, what the program does depends on where your thing, there's this thing called a program counter, is pointing. So your program counter, by default, when you turn the machine on, is pointing at address zero. And in address zero, there will be, um, there will be an instruction probably. And the instruction will say, will will lead to a boot, uh, what's called a bootstrap. And the bootstrap uh, is the I, reason why it's called bootstrap is because you're picking yourself up by your bootstraps. You, when you turn the machine on, it's trying to pick itself up by the bootstraps, which is kind of this unnatural um, idea that you're sit, you're sitting in a chair and you're going to pick yourself up by your bootstraps. It's like it's like how do you even do that you can't do that but a computer has to do it it has to pick itself up get up and start going and so you turn it on and it, it goes straight to address zero it executes when it's in address zero and what does it mean by executing it it means it interprets that byte to be a command to that to mean a command so in address zero there will be a value and the value might be one two three and then one two three might uh might might mean um add add register ax to three or something it might be and but that it actually might be a jump or it might be any number of different operations but the when it executes a piece of memory what it means by execution is it takes it to mean a, a command it's a command at that point so that piece of data that address points to a byte of data or a word of data and word is four bytes um, and, and a byte of data is is eight bits so a word is 32 bits and so the register the first uh, address is really a byte I mean all the addresses in the computer are going to be bytes but a word will eat up four so actually if the first address and it is expecting a word then this is going to be that this is how many bytes are going to be used up for that word and if the computer is um, if the first byte in that address represents the beginning of a command it will know if it is a command or if it is if it's a one byte command or if it's a two byte command or if it's a 32 bit command and a one byte command would be something very simple like jump and and jump if not zero or something and, then, and jump if not equal to and then you but that would actually be two bytes so that would be dependent on if the 
register was that it was comparing to was just a byte. So it might be J and P or J, J and E. That's jump, jump if not equal to zero. And what that means is that means um, if the register that um, is used for conditional operations contains uh, one, if that register, so we say we moved into, I think it's AX, we move it into AX, the value one, and it said jump if not equal to zero, um, it is true, so it will jump one, it will jump one operation. Um, so the next operation, if it was equal to zero, then we would say jump to, and we'd give an address. So we'd say jump to x, it'd be zero x, this is, would be hexadecimal. And say jump uh, to 200, uh, to, um, that would be a, a specific address. So it would probably be something like uh, zero, zero, let's see, zero f. And so these would be measured in, uh, so that, that would be to a specific a command, uh, a specific memory location in the computer. And the whole time, if we're working using a debugger inside of uh, MS-DOS, it will be sitting there uh, telling us what address we're on. So it might look like that. That might be the address that we're on. And when we used a move AX1, that would be two bytes. So actually probably start out there. That would be, it's not gonna, that's gonna be within sight of the program. And the next one will be however big this instruction is. This is going to be a 16, this is going to be a 16 bit, or a two byte instruction. So it's going, the next address will be here because it'll use up zero and one and then jump if not equal to zero is a very basic, this is called a byte based thing because um, we're just giving a zero if it was jump if not equal to three four five, then that would act to, to store three four five requires more than one byte because the byte is limited to two fifty five zero through two fifty five is a byte. So if it was three four five, that would be um, that would actually require a word of information. So it would be a jump if not equal and then a word of data, or it would be a 16, it would actually be a, not a word, but um, a 16 bit word, um, which is just two letters. So two, two uh, bytes. And so this would be uh, one byte, this instruction would be one byte. So that would be zero X zero zero five. And so that, and so inside the computer, this might actually look like, you know, um, the first instruction, the second instruction might look like this. It might look like F E that's X hexadecimal. And it might be, no, it might be one F or something like that. And then the next one is zero one. And so this, this would be the move operation. With, and it would be a com compound, it would be move AX, so you're moving to an AX register. Um, and then one would be what you're moving in there, what value you're moving into that register. And then um, after that, you might have a jump operation, it might look like this, two one or two F or whatever, two A, it might be two A or something like that jump of not equal, and that would be the jump of not equal command. And then you would have um, 345 broken up into two bytes. And so the first byte would be the upper, the upper, um, what's called the, um, the little Indian version of the byte. So that's, it's not like little Indian or big Indian. They, what they're talking about is they're talking about 
one end or the other of the bite. So, um, this would be the big Indian, but it's on the left side. So it's, um, 255. So 345 divided by 255 is what? It, it, what would be easier is to get yourself out and go into, go into Google. And so we pop into Google and we type in um, uh, 345 in hexadecimal. And it gives us zero, zero 0159. So that's, um, so in our document, in here it's uh, zero one five nine, and that would be storing that number three forty five would be in this. So that's what it is to store the the number three four five, as it's one one five nine, and if you needed to verify if that was correct, you could say. Um, you can say 345, 345 divided by 255 is uh, 1 and then three, uh, 0 0.35, 0 0.35 times 255 equals 89. So it's 89 and um, 89 divided by 15 or by 16 or something like that so it's a five the first the the first digit of the hexadecimal digit is that 0.56 times 15 or 16 or something like that is eight so it's close so it's one five nine and that's how you would determine with with mathematics what uh, your if if it, that was correctly what you were getting back you know so it's that's how you know it's one five nine it's how it if you're to do it with a calculator you would take three three forty five you divide it by two hundred fifty six or um actually two hundred fifty five and then that and what you get left over you take that and you divide that by um well it's it's complicated but what you're doing um hexadecimal what hexadecimal is it's base 16 and the reason why we use hexadecimal is because with one hexadecimal number we can represent four but four bits and one byte comes to be um two two hexadecimal numbers and so rather than talking about this this hex um as a binary and binary is uh, ones and zeros um you would be representing a one with zero 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 one and F would be one 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 and uh, so the two A or okay the, the next one zero zero one that's zero 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 and then zero zero one and then two is zero zero one zero and an A is one zero one zero and <laughs> a zero is the zero and then zero zero one and then uh, one zero zero one that's five and a nine is um, one zero one zero um, actually I think this is a nine right there that's a nine so these bytes these hexadecimal numbers here represent th this in ones and zeros and if you were to do straight machine language programming you would be doing ones and zeros. You wouldn't be working with hexadecimal. Hexadecimal is just one step up from working with ones and zeros. It just makes things a little easier. And then there's things, something called assembly language programming, which is closer to an actual language. You can see what you're doing and you would pop in um, this stuff. Now, um, if you were if you were using something like an old Altair computer, so let's go and look up the Altair computer. So we type up Altair. This is the first computer that, uh, um, okay, the Altair computer. This is the first computer 
that um, that Bill Gates ever had any access to well it's the first one first personal computer this was the very first personal computer and notice it has no mouse it has no keyboard it has nothing on it just these switches and how would you program this kind of computer using just switches um, this is how it works you see this stuff here and what I was talking about um, earlier about the ones and zeros you would you would start out by you would figure out what the what the um, bit um, representation of a move operation was and that would probably be turning on certain switches so you would turn on you you have the first switch off the next one on the next one on next one off and you would do you would be putting out eight bits so your first so this would be like your first uh, byte that you would have to specify and what you would do is you'd turn on those switches you would set them to ones and zeros then you'd flip this one little switch which is called would be essentially the program counter and what it would that switch would say is um, I'm ready to register the next um, the next byte. So it might be that you switch it on and then you switch it off. And so it gives you the next um, byte. So the programmer counter increases by one and then you would pop in uh, zero, 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 because the, the value is one. So you pop in that. So you turn off all the switches and you turn on one switch and then you would take the program switch, uh, program counter switch, and switch it on and off. That would mean next, the next byte, and then you would type in zero 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 one zero, and that would be or something like that. That would be, or actually, it'd probably be something like yeah, I, you know, you don't, you don't know what the command a jump not equal look might look like that, and then you have to put in um, one five nine in hexadecimal. So you have, so you'd have to do, um, it's one and five nine is going to be, um, zero, zero, uh, five and then nine, one, zero, zero, one. So that would be that jump if not equal 34, 345. And so this is just the first part of your, of your program. Your program might end up being like 20 or 30 commands, and each command could be anywhere between one and four bytes. So you're pumping in like um, you could do, you could you could be reading off. Okay, I'm supposed to turn all this switch, and then I flip that switch, and then I do all these switches, and then I flip that switch, and that you're putting in a program byte by byte and it's laborious it's very tedious and once you're done with it then you say then you um, flip another switch that would execute from the very beginning of memory what it was what your program was going to do and it starts running your program and it might turn some lights on and off in a certain sequence and that might mean a question do you want to do this and so you hit a you use a flip a switch and that would be some sort of input and they said do you want to do this and so you flip a different switch and there is a there is a um, there's a, a video on the net if we go to YouTube so YouTube triumph of the nerds nerds and so you try for the nerds part one so this is a uh, desk in the 1950s, mainframes were as big as this garage, and that's because they were filled with thousands of these vacuum tubes or valves. 
Eventually, the valves were made much smaller and replaced with well, transistors. What is this thing from it? However, to make a computer that could fit on your desk. What that took was further miniaturization. Here we what have a silicon on here? Of silicon oh. etched with thousands of transistors. That this microprocessor strange. holds more than a million transistors, and that's the secret of the personal computer. So and this is the guy. Silicon Valley. Not See if we can get to the first. Um, These are the people who invented the microprocessor, Intel. Intel was started 28 years ago by a handful of guys after a row with their old boss. Their microprocessors okay, take about is... 85% of the world's computers. Let's see if we Intel can get the first. The chip. They are responsible for the laid-back Silicon Valley working style. Everyone was on a first-name basis. There were no reserved parking places, no offices. I'm looking through here to try to find them. Here it the is. Okay. And, and flew out. In fact, the night before, he, he got some sleep while I double-checked everything to make sure that we had, uh, had it all right. But I had no idea what it was really going to be like to... to fight okay, here it is. Ad required another nine switch. And I would use it to call on the person in question. Okay, here. Is what drove the hobbyists together. Roger Mellon and Harry Garland started an early computer company. They came here to meet others and to figure out just what the heck could be done with this new toy. A solution in search of a problem. There's no keyboard that I can see. The Altair was tedious to use. At first, the only way that data and instructions could be given to the computer was by flipping switches. Take something trivial like two plus two. Each two needed eight different switches to be flipped. Then a ninth switch was used to load them all. Add required another nine switches. The answer four was if the third light from the left turned on. Eureka! So if you had a program that was 100 bytes long, you had to go through this procedure 100 times to load that into memory. It took a long time. I bet it did. And what happened if you lost power or you lost your way in the middle? You cried. <laughs> <laughs> the Altair may have been frustrating, but it drove the nerds to experiment, finding real uses for the useless box, turning it from a curiosity to a computer. Steve Dompier set up an Altair, um, laboriously keyed a program into it. Somebody knocked the plug out of the wall, and he had to do that all over again, but nobody knew what this was about. After all, was it just going to sit and flash its lights? No. You put a little uh, uh, transistor radio next to the Altair, and he would, by manipulating the length of uh, loops in the software, could play tunes. The radio began playing The Fool on the Hill. Da 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 And the tinny little tunes that you could tell were coming from the noise that the computer was generated being picked up by the radio. Everybody rose and applauded. Uh, I proposed that he receive the uh, Strip Phillips Screw Award for finding a use for something previously thought useless. Uh, but I think everyone was too busy applauding to even hear me. It was a very exciting thing. It was probably the first thing the Altair actually did. Turning the Altair into a useful tool required a programming language so users could type their programs in rather than so flipping switches. See what he's doing what there? Was a version of some is he's, he's referencing uh, some code that he's written on a piece of paper so he knows exactly which bits he needs to be flipping in order to uh, in order to load in the register of memory and so he's loading in that register that that byte register into memory and you do it byte by byte and uh, that's old school that's really really old school programming and it goes just before we even had basic interpreters in fact um, what Microsoft was first making um, that got them into the door was a basic interpreter for um, for the Altair I think was what it was and so that's what they're talking about later on in here and this is say usually losing money at that point um, <coughs> one of the few times when that's been the case uh, Paul showed that to me uh, then, okay, here was a company that would be needing software. And you know, he said, okay, well, we've we got to call, we call these guys up and see if this thing is for real. We realized that things were starting to happen. And just because we'd had a vision for a long time of where this chip could go, what it could mean, 
Uh, that didn't mean the industry was going to wait for us while I stayed and, and finished my degree at Harvard. So called up Ed, you know, we told him, we've, we, we've got this basic and it's just, you know, for your machine, and it's, you know, it's, it's not that far from being done and we'd like to come out and show it to you. So that's so the basic the interpreter they were writing the paper and they wrote it. And, they and flew out. In fact, the night before they, he, he got they put it on a paper tape. They didn't. They didn't sure have the computer had, uh, to put it into. Right. They they were doing no this idea, from really from a piece of paper. They were making a paper really tape. They didn't even uh, computer before. You know. He was very nervous about whether this would actually work, and he got to the office, and we all gathered around, and he put the, his fingers on the switches, and he uh, loaded Basic in with paper tape into the Altair. You know, I was just, I was so nervous. I just, this is just, it's not gonna work. Not gonna, it worked. And it came up and it could do a few little simple things. And it was amazing when Paul called me up and said the thing had worked the first time. And of course it was incredibly fast. And it printed out memory size. And, and I think Bill said, well, it printed something. <laughs> so I said, yeah, yeah. Oh, that was, that was unbelievable. The fact that it really worked uh, was, was, a, was a breakthrough. Maybe there wouldn't be a Microsoft if it hadn't, if the screen hadn't come alive, who knows, it might all be quite different. So, what Microsoft did, their first technology they ever produced was a basic interpreter. And that's the, that's the program that I was showing you originally. This is a basic interpreter. And that was what Microsoft, that was the first thing they ever made was a basic interpreter so that you could program computers this way rather than having to, rather than having to do something like I had in that document, rather than doing this, rather than do, doing programs that look this way. How you would program something like that in Java, I mean, in not in Java, in, in basic, would be like this, you would say, um, what were we trying to do? Uh, move A, so we'd say A equals to one. So that's all that move A means is A equals one, 20. Uh, if A is not equal to zero, then uh, go to line 40. And that's a jump if not equal, jump the next byte and then 30 would be um, what we would do is probably say go to to 100 or something and then on the next line we would probably say um, start processing B equal something or you know and that that would be but the the basic assembly version of what I was working on would look something like that um, look like something like this inside of basic so if you wanted to do assembly language pr programming inside of basic just for the fun of it just to figure out how things work just keep in mind that you're that any kind of conditional you would be doing would be would look like this it would be a jump if jump if equal and so it might be a jump if not equal actually it might be jump if not equal and uh, in most cases uh jump if less than uh jump out that might be jump if less than or equal to or actually less than if less than and you know greater than might look like that so i, I don't remember what the actual assembly was because it's been uh, the last time i programmed an assembly i was 25 26 that was 96 that's like 25 years ago. So uh, it's been a long time. But I remember there were things in it like uh, um, inside of uh, MS-DOS you would use an interrupt. And you would say uh, run an interrupt. What an interrupt was was it was um, it, it did a number of things. One, one thing it did is it would take all of the registers. It, your processor has like eight registers. AX is one of those registers. So you would have like, it's like eight or 16 registers and they'd be like AX, BX, BX, and then CX and DX. And then they go on up from there. They, they're like different um, letterings. 
And so each one of those is a physical register inside of the computer. And you're basically just juggling data is what you're doing inside of the computer. And you would do a certain operation, like you would say, move to address location uh, 001 or 0010, or actually it's be, it would look more like this, F. And that would be a certain block of memory. So in the block of memory, somewhere actually it'd probably be even longer than that. It was a 20-bit address, so it'd be 0000, and then it would probably be like uh, 1 or F, uh, 100, something like that. And then um, it, would, it would probably, I, I think if I remember right, at first you had to deal with one and then there was um, the way it worked in the PC is it was really, you're really working with a 20 bit address, but you couldn't work with 20 bits. You worked with two 16 bit um, pieces of data and it would generate a 20 bit register from that. And, and what 20 bits is, is two to the 20th equates to one megabyte. And that was as much memory as you could address in the first IBM PCs. Um, the first IBM PC um, probably only had about um, 16 kilobytes or some, or 64 kilobytes. But when the PC was created, they weren't thinking that it was going to go on for years and years. They were thinking for a limited term, like five years. In fact, IBM created the PC with the idea of destroying the personal computing industry and because um, they were sure people were just not going to want a personal computer at home and so they were hoping it was a fad so they created the PC to destroy all of these all these personal computers like the apples and stuff to get them off the market so that they could get back all of their um, clients to buy into their mainframe computers which is where they were making their money so, um, but they were wrong. It turned out to be a huge industry and even bigger than the mainframe industry. And they, you know, and so it, it became a consumer thing. But anyhow, the original PC had only a megabyte uh, to address. And at that time, people thought, nobody's ever going to want anything more than 128 kilobytes a megabyte just i can't even imagine somebody trying to access a megabyte of memory that's just out of the realm of of you know that's just insane amount of memory and then you know after we got to a megabyte then we were like oh now we have the ability to address how many megabytes um, we went up from 20, we went to 24. Now we can address 16 megabytes. Nobody's ever going to want more than 16 megabytes. And then we went up from 24 bit to 32 bit and said, oh, now we can address four gigabytes. Nobody's ever going to want to address more than four gigabytes. And then we went from 32 to 64 bit memory and nobody's ever going to want, uh, four billion four gigabytes we haven't gotten past 64 i don't think anybody's ever going to get to a 64 memory address um because i think that's like more atoms than there is in the universe or something like that um let me see i may be wrong about that but let me see what is two two to the 64th power is this huge number 19 places um so i don't know what do they call it yeah there's the number right there that is the number of bytes that is 2 to the 64 or something like that i guess this is 2 to the 64th but that's literally this is a gig right here six 36 gigs there's your terabyte, two terabytes, 372 terabytes. And then this is a exabyte. I think three is an exabyte, 223 exabytes. And then nine is, uh, I don't know. That's just a crazy, 
crazily high number and we're kind of stuck right here the terabytes and terabytes are enough for us in this present day and age we can't imagine ever getting past a terabyte you know 372 terabytes who this is like google is probably somewhere up here they're like in the exabytes but this right here is just even a crazy ungodly number nobody is ever going to get to that you know but one of these days what this artificial intelligence guys are going to require more of this data and then they're just you know but how big is this in terms of um in terms of storage like how do we reason this out uh, well i'll leave that for another video so let me stop this one